They are defending Baldwin. This is sag after us saying an actor's job is not to be a firearms or weapons expert. What do you make of this? Well, I have to agree. I think what the, the overarching message from sag after is that it is their job, not the actor's job, to make sure that the firearms are safe. Did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, I must say, do people only think in absolutes? Are they capable of thinking in in subtle forms, that there are sometimes shades of grey and variations in certain things? So people are trying to say that Alec Baldwin is in the clear, that it's so obvious that this was an accident. Well, you know, not so fast, not so fast. Jonas Spilbaugh seems to think that it's not the actor's job to be a weapons expert, but that's not what we're talking about. He doesn't need to be a weapons expert. He simply needs to be able to do a basic safety check. I mean, do you really need to be a rocket scientist or some kind of um, weapons professional to shake a bullet and decide whether you hear a rattling sound? Because that is the difference between a live round and a dummy round. And by the same token, if you want a weapons expert to be the be-all, end-all on the set, then why would you hire someone like Hannah Gutierrez Reed? Because she definitely wasn't that. She was young, green, inexperienced, and apparently careless. And my question is, does this criminal defense attorney know much about um, safety protocols, right? Not what um, he said during the ABC interview about safety protocols, has she studied what those safety protocols are? Besides that, it's also not what other vet veteran actors have said during this debacle, like George Clooney and Nicolas Cage, that it is the, jo the, uh, the job of the actor to check the weapon. And I mean, what is so wrong about having an armorer check the weapon, and in this case, she seems to have made a mistake, and the actor checking the weapon, and in this case, it seems like he didn't check the weapon, but what if he had? Couldn't that have saved someone's life? Isn't that a protocol or a rule worth fighting for? Also, if you're going to act in a cowboy movie, a movie that's going to have a lot of gun uh, activity, a lot of gun action, and a lot of pretending to shoot people, maybe you should have your lead actor do a little training in protocol, what not to do, where not to point the gun. Does that make sense? Now, before we get to the rest of this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're new to the channel, you might be asking the question, Why so serious? Well, true crime is a, a field where we're thinking about somber subjects such as the truth and reality and justice. And on this channel, we do believe that is something we should start taking things a little more seriously. I also want to take this moment to thank the subscribers who are part of getting this channel over the 100,000 mark. I've actually just received my plug from YouTube, so thanks a lot for that. In terms of this episode, if you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button, and let's get started. When you look at the chain of events in this case, Marnie, I think it's clear that the least culpable person from a criminal standpoint is Alec Baldwin. Now, I know I've gotten... A now, the impression I get is this criminal defense attorney has based her knowledge and based her analysis. I could be wrong, but my impression is that she's basing her assessment on what Baldwin said in the ABC News interview. And that is not the situation that actually played out on the ground. What played out on the ground was a series of safety violations and one's also then got to look at the fact that we're not just dealing with Alec Baldwin, the actor. We're dealing with Alec Baldwin, the producer. We're dealing with Alec Baldwin, the lead actor, right? We're dealing with Alec Baldwin, the guy who actually um, uh, co-wrote the script in this case. He's kind of the visionary behind the story, right? And so someone in a senior role like that... Do they have any responsibility for safety? Do they have any personal responsibility for safety? Wouldn't you say that collectively a crew have a responsibility towards safety? Or is it always someone else who's to blame? Isn't it collectively a film crew have a responsibility towards safety? But I have to take it from the top and, and look at 
Where did the ammunition come from? Why don't we know how live ammunition got on a set at all? Then you go down to... So again, it seems like this criminal defense attorney is literally taking um, Alec Baldwin at face value exactly what he said. Is He said in that ABC News interview, the only question is where did a live round come from? And she's repeating exactly that. That is not the only question. That is a question. It's definitely not the only question. Then you look to the assistant director who said to Alec Baldwin, this gun is cold. I remember the, ar the armorer handed the actor a gun. I don't know if she said it was cold or clean, but she handed him the gun and then there was a bang that was a louder bang than I've heard come from a blank before. Okay. What does that mean? That means this gun is not capable of killing anybody unless you hit him over the head with it. I honestly think this is asinine because it's not, uh, it's not um, common cause that the assistant director did say that uh, cold gun um, that is something that Alec Baldwin said the assistant director said we don't know for a fact that that is what the assistant director said the other thing that the assistant director admitted was he said he didn't really check the gun either he sort of spun the barrel three quarters and basically had a quick glance at three to four rounds in it right now, if you take what the district attorney has said is, if each person along the way, Hannah Gutierrez Reed had checked the gun properly, Assistant Director Dave Halls had checked the gun properly, Alec Baldwin had checked the gun properly, if any one of those three individuals had done that, then you wouldn't have had the situation that we have. It doesn't belong in criminal court. It belongs where, it's, where it began, in civil court. Again, I've got to disagree with that because we're dealing with somebody who died on set, right? And we're dealing with somebody who almost died. We are also dealing with the fact that the health and safety report from that state find rust the maximum, which is giving you an idea how they saw the safety violations, that they were violated in such a way that it was worthy of the heaviest fine possible, that's how egregious, that's how severe it was. And, and in that sense, it seems as though they're saying, they're suggesting that this was a very reckless um, uh, setup. And also, in a situation, I've said this before, we have a situation where there's one accidental discharge, another accidental discharge, people on set complaining about safety, not only gun safety, but also COVID protocols, and then somebody gets shot to death. And then you say, oh, no, there was never any problem with safety. Um, I've got an idea. If Helena wasn't shot that day, somebody else would have been shot. And then again, you say, who's responsible? This is the, the bottom line question. Who's responsible for the safety on the set? And again, I would say collectively, everyone is responsible. But it was certainly that responsibility would fall more heavily on people like the armorer and also on the person who actually fires the shot that kills the person. So you think prosecutors are going to have a tough time with this one? I think they will, and I think they should have a tough time. I mean, I know they want to send a message, but you can't just claim that every because a firearm was used that it must have been criminal activity afoot. If I so there is another case where they tried to film a movie and it starred William Hurt, and they tried to film this movie on a railway bridge, and that actually led to somebody dying as well. Well, you had criminal charges there as well. In the Midnight Rider incident, the uh, producers were ch also charged with involuntary manslaughter and criminal trespass. That was around about nine years ago, on July 3rd, 2014. The very same situation was a factor there. Serious and willful safety violations. Was that the case? And in that case, uh, in 2015, Miller pled guilty to felony involuntary manslaughter and criminal trespassing, and he received a 10-year sentence, of which he served one year, followed by probation. Randall Miller was the director on that uh, production. The charges against some of the others were dropped as part of a plea agreement um, and one, one wonders whether that's not the case also with um, 
the assistant director where the, where the charges against him were lessened. So I don't think you can use what Alec Baldwin said during the ABC News interview, you know, that exclusive. I don't think you can use that as gospel, as your sole source of information on what actually happened during this. And that is the sense that I get from this interview. I could be wrong, but that is the way that it sounds like to me. When it comes to criminal culpability, when it comes to intent, when it comes to mens rea, the prosecution is not going to be able to show that he had what it took to criminally prosecute him. Again, we're not talking about the intent to shoot Helena. We're talking about something else. It's willful action and it's uh, a certain amount of uh, recklessness that amounts to a certain amount of uh, that are really amounts to a kind of intent in the sense of one's not being one's not being intentionally safety conscious, but the opposite. There's no no intention to be safety conscious, and what is that? That is reckless, and is that recklessness dangerous? And is that recklessness dangerous to a criminal level? Well, somebody died in this situation. The criminal defense attorney also, at the end of this interview, makes kind of a big noise about, you better well know where the live round came from. Again, there wasn't just one live round. There were, there were hundreds of live rounds. And so how can you have a situation like that where there are hundreds of live rounds? It's not a single safety slip-up. It's a culture that is not safe. And I think what one's got to address here is where does that culture of safety or lack of safety start? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.